Welcome to another episode of Thoughts of a Techno Wizard. No, I'm sorry. Goodness, becoming a Techno Wizard in this one. Um, it is Sunday afternoon, so not quite Sunday morning, but I did like a almost two hour episode on my podcast this morning. And then I worked on my newsletter. So I was doing stuff, just not this. Uh, <laughs> um, so go check that out if you're interested in my podcast and uh, my newsletter. Hopefully, I will say I'm gonna, it's gonna come out in August, okay? Which is it's been a long time, but it's gonna come out in August, and hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to get a better cadence with all these things. You know, um, I mean, my podcast has been doing okay. I do good when I don't have to edit or or you know, you know, kind of refine things too much. And I could just go and, and just do something and not think about you know how the setup and all the other stuff this is why I do my podcast usually multiple times a week but nonetheless um yeah go check that out if you if you're if you like let's get started with this episode I'll try not to take too long I don't want to take a whole hour um because I do have places to go I'm going hiking all right um but we'll see what we uh what we can learn in this section of um the phenomenology of spirit so to recap the last section I say uh Hegel talks about how consciousness develops in stages throughout history, how analyzing these stages educates our consciousness and helps us to fulfill our souls or spirit. In the process of growing our consciousness, we realize that we do not have complete knowledge. That moment can be debilitating. We may then try to gain knowledge by following or learning from the authority of others or following our own personal convictions. But we must be careful because both of those could, of course, lead us astray. Furthermore, there is an added conceit we can fall into from just following personal conviction, as we can gain a sense of misguided pride from being original or independent thinkers, regardless of the quality of uh, Really? Is it disconnecting like that? Sorry about that. Um, it's especially hard because we inevitably get to a point of existential doubt and despair. When we practice real skepticism, we begin to question things in such a way that change ourselves. This process is important because it forces us to consider whether all we thought true is really true. If we pursue that, then we can begin to really practice cognition. But if we don't, we can easily fall into false senses of security and surface level knowledge. That's my recap. Um, now let me go over as usual, Dr. Sattler's recap, recap of the last section. He says, um, Hegel addresses the matter of the development of the dialectic in these paragraphs, discussing the stages or just Dalton that consciousness must pass through on its way to knowledge or the life of the spirit. He also addresses again, the question of skepticism an ever-present possibility for any given consciousness, but a cul-de-sac on the way of dialectical development. Dead end. Skepticism does, however, play a vital role in placing consciousness into a despair from which it must emerge, getting it past natural consciousness, reliance upon authority, and assertion of the perspective of the self. Yeah, that was beautiful. He has a much more refined, you know, um, summary than my own. <laughs> and I like he brought in, you know, the... the uh, skepticism piece i forgot to mention that so let's get into this section here the necessary right. progression and interconnection of the forms of the unreal consciousness right up, sorry there we go is that really okay whatever will by itself bring to pass the completion of the series to make this more intelligible it may be remarked in a preliminary no, and general to the series, connection of the <laughs> the necessary progression and interconnection of the forms of the unreal consciousness will by itself bring to pass the completion of the series to make this more intelligible it may be remarked in a preliminary and general way that the exposition of the untrue consciousness in its untruth is not a merely negative procedure the natural consciousness itself normally takes this one-sided view of it and a knowledge which makes this one-sidedness in its very essence itself one of the patterns of incomplete consciousness which occurs on the road itself and will manifest itself in due course 
This is just the skepticism, which only ever sees pure nothingness in its result, and abstracts from the fact that this nothingness is specifically the nothingness of that from which it results. Mm. For it is only when it is taken as the result of that from which it emerges that it is, in fact, the true result. In that case, it is itself a determinate nothingness, one which has a content. The skepticism that ends up with the bare abstraction of nothingness or emptiness cannot get any further from there, but must wait to see whether something new comes along and what it is in order to throw it to into the same empty abyss. Mm. But when, on the other hand, the result is conceived of as it is in truth, namely as a determinate negation, a new form has thereby immediately arisen, and in the negation, the transition is made through which the progress through the complete series of forms comes about of itself. Mm. So yeah, I, again, I don't want to spend an hour, so I won't. I won't get too much into it, at least not this time. But I do like. At least I, it seems like he's setting it up once again that dialectic is like, okay, here's how the dialectic works. You know, you come up to, to a point where you feel like, oh, there's nothing left. You just, you know, uh, what, what can you do? And most people want to back up at this point, but you're saying, no, you got to jump into there, into the abyss and then let it, let it take you and then come back out and, you know, do this whole process and stuff like that. That's, that's pretty cool. We could say that section 79 really is about what earlier in the preface Hegel called determinate negation, something that he's going to employ as part of the very logic of inquiry over and over and over again throughout the course of this dialectical investigation. And we want to look at the relationship between determinate negation and natural consciousness. And I've got a few diagrams up here on the board that will be helpful for us, but we want to try to expand this outward a bit as well. I can't put as much on the board as would be helpful for this. Now he starts out talking about unreal consciousness. And you notice that I put the on in brackets there because for the consciousness at that particular stage in the development of, of human history, consciousness, dialectic, all that sort of thing, they take that as being real. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we want to talk about um, the development of human freedom and the change in the, the understanding of, of slavery, of servitude, and its conditions, we can say that, you know, we have some sort of process that, that, that you know, gradually enfranchises, or at least says people ought to be, you know, <coughs> enfranchised, manumitted, um, but earlier on, there's this notion that, well, human beings are, are many of them fit to be slaves. Mm -hmm. Some may be fit to be masters, but certainly some are fit to be slaves. And people take that as a sort of given. That's part of their natural consciousness. Now, from the standpoint of something that's further developed, that can be seen as being unreal or untrue. But from the standpoint that those people are in at that point in time, they can, they can suspect, they can have a glimmer that, wow, this, this can't really be how, how things are supposed to be. But it, it's very difficult for them to step outside of it mm -hmm. because you need some sort of vantage point from which to even be able to think. Um, mm -hmm. And we might go even further back and somebody might say, you know, think about the Babylonian um, Enuma Elish, right? Uh, major important uh, religious document in, in Babylonian religion. Human beings were created to be slaves of the gods so that the gods didn't have to be slaves to each other because mm -hmm. they had been slaves to each other and caused all sorts of ruckuses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that could be part of that unreal consciousness with respect to slavery. And we could do this you know, with respect to economics. We could do this with respect to political, um, mm -hmm. uh, political development. We could do this with respect to artwork. We could do this with respect to religion, law, any of the sorts of things that Hegel's interested in. It's funny. You can, you can see this to this day, right? It's like... Um, there is so, and this is where I actually might disagree with Hegel from in terms of how you see that stages, right? Um, because I've been learning, you know, there's this term called mental hierarchy, right? The idea that there's certain things that people are unable to really think about um, because the society around them is in higher is in a hierarchical structure that does not allow you to think about these things, that does not encourage, and in fact, usually disincentivizes and punishes you for thinking about these certain things, right? A great example to that for today is um, the idea that you go against capitalism, right? The idea that capitalism is bad and that, you know, it's ultimately in a bad system and that we should be thinking about better systems, right? Even those that um, agree that capitalism is not great will refuse to admit, oh, there's any better that we can do because they say, oh, socialism was terrible. Communism was terrible. This is the, you know, all systems are bad. This is just the best bad one we have, right? You hear that crap all the time. And what that really means is that we are today, or many people today, at least, because I don't want to say, because many of us that thinking beyond capitalism, but nonetheless, there are a lot of people who are incapable of seeing outside of where we are today, right? Of seeing outside of and beyond, you know, this uh, system of capitalism, things like that, um, because the environment itself is const constrains your thinking, right? And so 
I would I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call this a stage, right? Because stage implies that you know it's kind of a linear kind of development, right? Where you go from um, even this 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 uh, viewpoint, right? So seeing unreal consciousness in terms of you know these different points, right? If anything, I would frame it as a sort of web or you know a more spatial type of you know unreal consciousness in different areas, and in each unreal consciousness, right? The parentheses. What makes it a parenthesis between real and unreal and realizing that it's unreal is the environment, the environmental structure, right? The environment, if any place in time, constrains how people were able to think about those elements. So that's where I might disagree. But let's 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 see. Let's hear him out. Let's see where he's going with this. Now, there is a progression that's going on. And Hegel talks about a necessary progression and interconnection between all of these stages. Mm. It's leading ultimately to some sort of completion, which he takes himself to be lucky enough to be in the vantage point of in 1807. This is hilarious, because <laughs> look where we are now, like 200 years later, and like, there's a lot y'all was missing back then, right? <laughs> um, this is one of those points where we might say, well, I, I, I buy, you know, 95% or 86% of the Hegelian, you know, process and Hegelian philosophy, but this is one of the ones that I'm not going to quite buy, because I don't think that history has indeed and, and that's a bigger question that we don't need to worry about at this point, particularly when we're trying to do the introduction to, to this text. But it is something yeah, I want sure. to signal, mm -hmm. that perhaps this completion point is further off than Hegel took it to be. Mm -hmm. In any case, what brings... And it might not even be a completion point, right? It might just be a constant, you know, development or back and forth or whatever. So, but let's see what he's building up here. It's about this completion is the realizing of this necessary progression and the interconnection between these stages. So it's not just like, you know, well, here's a stage and now here's another stage and this one is a total, you know, supersession of this one. Everything in this one is gone and we just keep on moving, you know, with, with things that have nothing in common with each other. Mm -hmm. No, they're, they're connected with each yeah. other. There are traces of the, the very earliest stages still in our society today and, you know, sort of assimilated, transformed. Hegel thinks that that's part of the tissue of human society, of mm -hmm. human consciousness, of human thought. So that's, that's a, an important uh, point to, to sort of dwell upon. Yeah. And, and for me, I, I know I'm pausing a lot and we all say, I don't want to go too long, but <laughs> for me, it's like, again, I view this not just from a perspective of what Hegel's talking about, but also learning what I, everything I've learned so far about, you know, the history of humanity and delving into anthropology and delving into anarchist theory and things like that. Well, you begin to see that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of times, right there's a lot of knowledge and history that is either lost, ignored, or, you know, just, just misconstrued, right, at any point in time. So even if a society, right, develops from another society, they may have not developed, you know, in a, in a sort of a linear direction, right? They may have taken some parts and dismissed others, and that in some ways it makes their society worse, but in some ways makes their society better, right? And we see this today, right? Today, we can, most of us say, okay, all slavery is bad, obviously, right? Many of us think this is a no-brainer. So that you can say our society is better in that way. But also at the same time, many of us don't even know what a good community looks like, right? We, we, we can't even imagine, you know, uh, or we live in a space where there's so many people and we have this inherent almost, you know, distrust of other people. And we have this inability to come together for certain things for good reason, right? Because there is a mis- mishap in uh, authority and who gets to who gets a say right so some of us might disagree on a topic that we feel is life affirming or life you know altering or risky where if you believe like abortion right if you believe abortion should be illegal and i believe that it should be legal then you think it's a moral imperative and all these terrible things and i think it's, it's a moral thing is gonna you know destroy um our society and stuff like that and so we there's something that we can't come to, to grips with Right. Versus um, in, in past societies, the only people who were able to vote or or who had a say in their group were the people in that community. Right. So you wouldn't you didn't uh, not all the time. Granted. Right. Because this is a bigger problem. And this goes into why I delved into anarchistic theory in the first place, because, you know, viewing society as a straight linear kind of development doesn't really make sense because throughout most of human history or most of recorded um imperialistic history right you see this this same pattern where you have a misshape and who gets to say who gets to say in and how society develops but nonetheless um and certain societies right throughout history you had you did have anarchistic 
or, you know, you can call it egalitarian, you know, flat organizations, direct democracies, where you had a high or everybody felt like they had a say, right? And how society was developed. And therefore, the development of that society, right, was very different than the development of hierarchical societies, right, where only certain people had a say in how things went. And so when those are... Goodness, why is it having connection issues? This is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, when when they you know would kill them off, they would not take everything that they you know that the democratic you know direct democracy or consensus consensus based egalitarian societies had, right? So a lot of that you know knowledge gets gets lost, right? So how does that play into the development, right? It's not it's not really getting developed because you're not um internalizing you know what was there before right you're just kind of cherry picking and for better or worse so how does that play into this you know um progression as a way right it's more like a more complicated shape where yes there is a development of what came before but there's or rather there's a um interconnection of what came before but there's also a kind of cherry picking and and you know uh, for better or worse type of type of thing going on where it's not necessarily always linear or always going up it's like yeah anyways <laughs> it's more complex and that's why i think we need to figure out how to how to uh model now here in all of this he's looking at what happens at each of these points we have a natural consciousness and a natural consciousness is a particular you know, shape of consciousness at a given point in time, a given culture, a given society. Um, it can be an individual, it can be a group, it can be the entire society. And he says, um, natural consciousness uh, is untrue consciousness. And what happens in this process is the untruth is being, the untruth that it is, is being revealed to natural consciousness. Mm. The question then, this is, you know, a really important point, shows you that there's, it's not a necessary, like, lockstep, you know, this must follow from this kind of progression that we're talking about here. Because there's options. Mm. <clears throat> the natural consciousness can say, screw it. I don't want to deal with this. Mm. We're, we're, this look, we're sticking with the way things are. And if you get in our way, we're going to kill you. Mm -hmm. That's one possibility. He doesn't actually talk about that possibility here. But that is something that does happen in a lot of stages in history mm -hmm. when people are proposing changes or just shaking things up, isn't it? Yeah. Here he says, the natural consciousness takes a negative, it normally takes a negative, one-sided view of things. And <clears throat> a knowledge which makes this one-sidedness its very essence in itself is one of the patterns of what he calls incomplete consciousness. Skepticism is incomplete consciousness. It's not a, it's not a, a waypoint at which we want to stop. It's actually mm. sort of a degeneration within the dialectic. It's an ever-present possibility for us to go radically off into a cul-de-sac, uh, which we're going to find totally uh, fruitless. Mm. Imagine it's a cul-de-sac and you've been driving for a while, and you've got a long trip ahead of you, you pull into this cul-de-sac, and it's got all these houses, and nothing's in them, nothing to eat, nothing to do, <laughs> and that's it. Are you going to stay there? Um, <clears throat> now, Hegel says that skepticism ends up taking a, a view on this realization of untruth, and the fact that, you know, this isn't, isn't all what it needs to be. This isn't, you know, as true as it, as it pretended to be. It's not real. It's unreal. And it, it takes uh, the result to be pure nothingness. Mm. It says, well, it's all crap. It's, it, none of it's true. There's nothing that's true. <clears throat> this is what we would call nihilism in, mm. in other respects as well, although Hegel doesn't use that term. So he says that it, um, it only sees pure nothingness in its result, and it abstracts from the fact that this nothingness is specifically the nothingness from, uh, of that from which it results. So, again, if we're taking slavery, and somebody comes along and starts talking about uh, abolition and freedom and the rights of human beings and human dignity and stuff like that, a skeptic might come along and say, look, you're, you're going to get rid of slavery, you're going to get rid of hierarchy, you're going to get rid of order, it's just going to be <laughs> chaos. Nobody will know anything. Everyone will be just dominating everybody. And the progress is made by some sort of determinate nothingness, mm. which isn't a real nothingness. It's not a pure nothing. It's a negation of where this was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, think about uh, American slavery, right, in the, the pre-Civil War South. What did Reconstruction do? 
I mean, the, 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 the opponents of Reconstruction sure were skeptics in this sense. They came along and they're like, oh, total chaos. Everything's going to be, you know, no disorder, the whole world upside down, and no telling what's going to happen. And, of course, they contributed to that chaos themselves as much mm -hmm. as they could. But there were plans. Well, we're going to create a Freedmen's Bureau. We're going to try to do something about the uh, institutions here. We're going to create um, new educational institutions so that... Uh, Free, <coughs> freed slaves can actually be trained and, and receive the benefits of, of a, a modern civilization. Mm -hmm. That was a determinant negation of the previous thing. Mm -hmm. That's got some, some specificity, some particularity, some reality to right. it, some truth to it. But unfortunately, it, like, like, left it's, something. it's not a nothing. <laughs> to talk about it in terms of nothing is a little bit misleading, but it is the nothing of this, right? It shows that this is empty, this is full of holes, this is a nothingness. And then something else is the result of it. So he says that um, if you pick one or the other of these, that's going to be a pretty fateful choice. Um, the skepticism that ends up with the bare abstraction of nothingness or emptiness cannot get any further. So this is a, like I said, a cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. You're not going to develop any further dialectically from there. But somebody else will. I mean, if you decide that you want to be a skeptic, the interesting thing is the dialectic doesn't wait for you. You're not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, perhaps over in India or in Guyana, who's going to develop. And if your society wants to remain stuck in, in you know, the past or stuck in skepticism, uh, for some form of nihilism, somebody else will come along and make the dialectic work. Mm. Now, this progress gives you a new shape, a new consciousness. That one's also unreal, but it can only be seen as unreal from the vantage point of when it starts to disintegrate and move mm. to another shape. So, point. you know, we're posed with this, you know, over and over again. And this possibility of choosing this, uh, or choosing the, I almost feel like John Madden here, right? <laughs> choosing uh, skepticism. <laughs> skepticism is an ever-present possibility, but it will never result in any sort of progress, any sort of movement, any sort of growth. <clears throat> Real growth does require some sort of process of determinate negation, mm. and that's what happens throughout this entire chain. Beautiful, beautiful. I should let him but talk the goal first. is as necessarily fixed for knowledge as a serial progression. It is the point where knowledge no longer needs to go beyond itself, where knowledge finds itself, where notion corresponds to object and object to notion. Mm. Hence, the progress towards this goal is also unhalting, and short of it, no satisfaction is to be found at any of the stations on the way. Whatever is confined within the limits of a natural life cannot, be by, its own, cannot by its own efforts go beyond its immediate existence, but it is driven beyond it by something else, and this uprooting entails its death. Mm. Consciousness, however, is explicitly the notion of itself. Hence, it is something that goes beyond limits. And since these limits are its own, it is something that goes beyond itself. Mm. With the positing of a single particular, the beyond is also established for consciousness, even if it is only alongside the limited object as in the case of spatial intuition. Thus, consciousness suffers this violence at its own hands. It spoils its own limited satisfaction. When consciousness feels this violence, its anxiety may well make it retreat from the truth and strive to hold on to what it is in danger of losing but it can find no peace. If it wishes to remain in a state of unthinking inertia, then thought troubles its thoughtlessness and its own unrest disturbs its inertia. <laughs> or if it entrenches itself in sentimentality, which assures us that it finds everything to be good in its kind, then this assurance likewise suffers violence at the hands of reason. For precisely insofar as something is merely of a kind, reason finds it not to be good. Mm. Or again, its fear of the truth may lead consciousness to hide from itself and others be behind the pretension that its burning zeal for truth makes it difficult or even impossible to find any other truth but the unique truth of vanity. That of being at any rate cleverer than any thoughts that one gets by oneself or from others. Mm. This conceit, which understands how to belittle every, every truth in order to turn back into itself and gloat over its own understanding, which knows how to dissolve every thought and always find the same barren ego instead of any content, this is a satisfaction which we must leave to itself, for it flees from the universal and seeks to be on, seeks to only to be for right, itself. So. Beautiful, beautiful. Again, I don't want to take too much time, but here the the idea of like the notion being for itself, right? The how consciousness what what came to mind as I was reading that, as I was hearing, watching, reading that stuff like that is um, how like when you think about something. Um, like you, he's told the example of like in spatial examples, like you take a, a shape or something like that. The fact that you can think of the shape and then think of, you know, what it would be like if it was in a different shape, right. Or outside of the shape, right. Similar to when we're thinking about ourselves, right. We, the fact that we can see ourselves 
from an almost third, you know, body experience, a, a, a quote unquote objective experience, right? Um, we can see outside of ourselves, um, at least mentally, allows us to think beyond ourselves. And at the same time, it also means that it's difficult to constrain our own consciousness so long as we're thinking, right? So long as we're actually engaging in thought, then it becomes difficult for, for us to just be satisfied with not, you know, knowing or not thinking or not, you know, going beyond, right? The very act of the fact that we can think about things and be aware of things, be conscious of things, holds in it the ability to go beyond those things that we're thinking about. And so it, we can constantly, you know, grow our consciousness and our and our understanding of the world, which I find it's, it's really fascinating. I like that. In section 80, we're arriving at a very important point where Hegel is going to reiterate something that he has he's said before, he's developed a little bit before, but now he's going to set it in a very stark term. And that's what consciousness has to do with limits and the overcoming of limits. Why consciousness is necessarily drawn into doing so. Mm. So first, before we do that, let's uh, talk about how he begins this, this section. Um, he says that the goal, the Ziel in, in German, the end, the point of all of this, and I've got this kind of, you know, chiasmatic structure here, where the notion corresponds to the object, and the object corresponds to the notion. That's what we want to arrive at. That's the point where we can say um, knowledge has actually attained to what it was supposed to be. Consciousness is fully developed, he says. Um, it's the point where knowledge no longer needs to go beyond itself. Now we're actually talking about limits. So how will we know that we no longer have any more limits that we need to um, go beyond? Well, because the notion will correspond to the object, the object will correspond to the notion for pretty much everything that we want to think about. Before we go on to the rest of this and talking about satisfaction, I want to dwell a little bit on the German terminology here because mm -hmm. there's some interesting, not so much plays on words, but some resonances that are kind of built into it. So notion we've encountered quite a lot before, begriff, right? Begreifen literally means to like grab onto. To, when we say wrap our heads around something, that's sort of what Hegel's talking about with begreifen. Um, and we've seen that, that a begriff, a, a concept, a notion of something, is a self-moving entity. Um, it is partly what we are, but it's, it's also, to a certain extent, you know, sort of othering itself, alienating itself from us, and we have to bring it back to mm -hmm. us. So there's this whole dynamic process going on there that already involves some moving past limits, setting up limits, moving past them, bringing them back in. Now, object has this word gegen in it. Gegenstand, which is the word that, that gets translated here as object, and quite correctly so, literally means that which stands against, that which is opposed to. Hmm. Um, so this chalk is not me. It is standing out from me while being in my hand, just as much as the ring is, just as much as the tie is standing out from, as the red of it is standing out from the blue of the shirt, although the blue of the tie perhaps echoes the blue of the shirt. We get all dialectical <laughs> and complex with this if we want to. The point is that objects already stand over against us as something different, mm -hmm. something other. And our concept, our notion, our begriff of the object now we've introduced several different things that are in, in the sort of mutual opposition to each other, but also relation to each other. They constitute limits for each other. And this, this corresponds to, in German, is Entsprechen. Um, Sprechen is, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of core of this, to speak, to, to, to talk, to connect up, mm. um, to, 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 you know, locate, if we want to play off of Latin things, loquate, right? Um, in any case, there's this, this sort of chiasmatic structure. When I say chiasmatic structure, I mean an X, right? The notion corresponds to the object. The object corresponds to the notion. They are, in some respect, all bound together. It doesn't matter which side we look at. That's how we can tell that things are complete. That gives us a criterion. Mm. Now, that's almost never the case, as it turns out throughout the dialectic. There's always going to be some discrepancy between the notion and the object to which it's corresponding to, which means that the notion has to change to make up to the object. But in the process, the object also you know, is revealed as not corresponding to its own notion. The object itself has to change. And so this whole dynamic process is able to take place. That's why Hegel says there's no satisfaction to be found by consciousness along the way. Hmm. Now, along what way? Along the way to absolute knowledge to the grasp of the totality. Now that's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? You can't possibly be satisfied unless you know the totality, and you not only know it like in the sense of one single intuition, but you know it in this complex, systematic way <laughs> that um, you know, presumably you're only going to get through Hegelian philosophy. 
Well, you know, it's not as if this was, a, you know, really a bestseller in its own time, but it's not as if this book was like flying off the shelves and you couldn't keep it in stock because everyone was, par you know, <laughs> I got to get the absolute knowing. How am I going to, how am I going to figure this out? I can't be satisfied. Oh, I made it to the, you know, the, the master slave dialectic. That's great stuff, but I can't stay there. I got to keep moving on. That's, that's <laughs> not what he's saying happens. As a matter of fact, most of history is, you know, there's a stage here and people stay in that stage for a long time and then there's a few trendsetters that start saying, hey, we need to move to something else. And a lot of people are, you know, saying, ah, oh, you're, you're full of, you know, nonsense. Uh, harumph, I'm not going to do that. And then it takes a while before things actually change. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, you know, the ancients would already be where Hegel is, right? So he's not saying that there aren't poss it's not possible to have stopping points. What he is saying is that if consciousness is actually following itself out and not allowing itself to sink into a couple traps that come up along the way, it is going to be inhabited by a sort of restlessness that's almost Augustinian. You know, Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they, they rest in you, God. Hmm. And for Hegel, you know, this is why he's not an Orthodox Christian, he would say, until we're actually, until we brought God into the system and we are parts of the entire system and we've sort of figured out where we fit in, um, our, our hearts are not going to be restless, nor are our minds. There's always right. going to be something kind of kind of nagging at us. Now, he has this interesting discussion about limits. And I'm representing limits here with uh, the two bars because we have to have some way to graphically represent them. He says things that are purely natural, there is one limit that really matters for them. And when they pass beyond it, they pass beyond it into death. Life ends. Um, things that are purely natural cannot conceive of how to get past those limits, like he says. He says, um, whatever is confined within the limits of a natural life, well, there's the limits, cannot by its own efforts go beyond this, its immediate existence. So it can't really have a history. Hmm. If we're purely confined to the natural, if that's all we are, then we can't have a history, we can't have societies, we can have, you know, ant heaps, we can have packs, but those are not the same thing, are they? Maybe they're better in certain respects, right? Every ant knows its place and feels pretty good about what it's doing, I suppose. Um, not, you can't say the same thing about human societies. But this is something that's characteristic of purely animal life. When we're talking about human consciousness, Hegel says, consciousness is different. Consciousness is the notion of itself. It is, you might say, necessarily reflexive. Mm. I can take standpoints upon myself. You know, for instance, I can think to myself, I wish I would have started shooting these videos a little bit earlier so that uh, there'd be a lot more of the phenomenology behind me. I'm taking a point on myself, my own activity, um, my desires, uh, the projects that I've got lined up for myself. There's a whole bunch of things that I'm actually making part of my consciousness in just saying that one simple sentence. Mm. You see how complexly reflective that is? It's not like there's just one single looking at the self. There's all these interweavings that are constantly taking place, oftentimes implicitly without us even realizing it. Right. If you have high self-esteem or low self-esteem, that is a position upon yourself. That's a consciousness of yourself. It has something. Mm -hmm. We could go on and multiply examples uh, forever, right? Just, I'll give you just one. If you're conscious of your role as a student, as a father or mother, as a son or daughter, you are conscious of yourself in relation to other things, and there's a whole complex relationship yep. that, uh, of, of what comprises consciousness, the, the begriff, the concept going on there. The notion of son already contains a lot of stuff if we unpack it. It's on object. That's the way any notion is for Hegel. That's what's so cool about him. Now, consciousness also has a beyond, just like natural life does. But Consciousness is something that, by its own nature, goes beyond limits. It sets up limits for itself, and then it goes beyond them. Hmm. This is what the process of human life really is. A whole bunch of transgressions of limits, and it's not as if the limit doesn't exist, or never existed. It does exist. But we do go beyond it. Right. That's what it is to be a human being. That is, indeed... Freedom. Freedom. That can be really scary, too, because we can, we can realize, whoa, all these things that I think are limits really aren't limits, and we can feel like we're going to fall into the void, right? Hegel's very, very conscious of that. 
So he says, um, it's, it's, it's something that goes beyond limits, and since these limits are its own, it's also something that goes beyond itself in the process. It knows that it's going beyond limits. It knows that it's making more of itself than it started with. He gives an example here of spatial intuition, which I'm not really that interested in, but here's what the point. Consciousness suffers this violence at its own hands. Consciousness is never entirely what it is. It's always to some degree going beyond itself. Its very freedom poses a problem to it. It's because it's free, it means that consciousness can never entirely have itself until it gets to this point, of course. But it's not there. This is why, earlier in, in the dialectic, if you're conscious, fully conscious, you won't be satisfied. You will want something beyond. And here Hegel considers a couple different traps or temptations that, that consciousness can fall into. Unthinking inertia. Mm. Somebody says, look, I'm just not going to think about this. I, I'm just, you know, a worker. Uh, I don't need to think about, you know, what the, the meaning of my work is or what it means for me to be a worker or, you know, what, what history has to say about working. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of people like this with unions, by the way. Um, unions great thing, you know, really necessary at some point. Maybe some of them aren't all necessary today, but union members are all like, man, we're, you know, we're the people who actually got you the eight-hour workday. No, you weren't. It was those guys back then, about 100 years ago, mm. uh, or, you know, 50 years ago, or whatatever. Not, not exactly you. Um, but, you know, they can be unthinking inertia. You can do this as a college professor. Why should we study Plato? I can't believe you would ask me that question. Of course we have to study Plato, because everyone's been studying Plato since Plato wrote. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? It's not much of a response. Mm -hmm. So he says, um, when, when consciousness, you know, tries to, uh, you know, just go into unthinking inertia, then what happens? Well, that works just fine, so long as you don't think. So mm -hmm. long as nothing to... I got to say, he didn't, uh, I got to call the bout, you know, same thing for capitalists. <laughs> we're like, oh, we just got to make more money. You know, it's just what we got to do, right? Just push that profit line up, push that growth, you know, just grow, 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 right? The economists would say, oh... We're just here to we're just you just got to grow the economy, right? No real, you know, thinking as to why or you know the negative ramifications or things like that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Disturbs that inertia. So long as you don't start to become conscious of the fact that you actually do have some freedom and you chose that perspective, and there's no internal necessity that, can, that requires you to take it on. Mm. So long as you can keep yourself from thinking about that, you're doing it. You're doing okay. Maybe alcohol would help. Maybe drugs mm -hmm. would help. Maybe learning some slogans. You know, I mean, we could come up. You know, some brain damage. We could mm -hmm. come up with all sorts of ways in which this could actually get, get pulled off. Money. But if you do that, you're kind of <laughs> losing something of the human in the process, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Hegel talks. This is why it's so dangerous of where we are today is like we have so many ways to not think, right? To just consume, right? Or just to, or even just to produce, right? Just where you become um, just an inertial being that's just doing things, right? Like in any other animal, just consuming or producing and not really thinking about why or what you're doing or, you know, what if you could be doing something different, right? Um, and that's why. I understand when people say, oh, with intelligence comes things like depression and stuff like that. Because it's like the it's that skepticism, right? It's that fear that, oh, nothing means anything, right? But with that, you have to move beyond that. You don't have to choose that option. You can also, you can choose the better option of, okay, let's figure out what does have meaning, right? Why does it have meaning? Why do we think it has meaning, all right? Let's stick with that and then go again. Like, so, okay, why does this have meaning? Why is it, right? Um at any point in time, sure, you can settle, be like, we're probably going to get into be uh, sentimental or just not think any further, things like that. Think we've gotten to the end. But in reality, we probably won't get, ever get into the end. And that's what really, that's what also scares people, right? Is it the idea that you there, there might not be an end. There might not be a conclusion. There might not be a point where we feel like we've we've learned everything and we've, we understand everything. But to me, that is super exciting. Because to me, that means that there's always more to learn, right? There's always more to do. There's always more that we can be better at. And so to me, it's like having it's like having an assurance of, Im of immortality, of realizing that you will never die. Not because of death doesn't exist, but because there's always more to learn. And there's, as long as we exist, there's going to be future people that also begin asking these questions, right? They also try to figure out what's going on. Right. No matter how advanced we become, there's probably going to be more barriers to knowledge and more things to understand. That's just so beautiful and so exciting to me.
So um, I know other people was probably not exciting to other people, but I don't know. Ask yourself why. <laughs> Talks about a second one. This is really interesting. Sentimentality. This is one that he's actually going to hit on later on and talk about this very same dialectic between sentimentality or the heart and reason. Mm. And he says, if it entrenches itself in sentimentality, something that happens a lot in our culture, which assures mm. us that it finds everything to be good in its kind. So this is a sort of, well, you know, think about that model that people have. Man, it's all good. And then, you know, if you think about that, you'll say, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are terrible. Yep. Well, now you're actually using reason, and that's something quite different than sentimentality. Sentimentality listens to the happy song, which, by the way, I love. You know, I actually uh, get into it, and it does make me happy. Mm -hmm. But the happy song is not reality, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm happy, da-da-da-da. Uh, no, that's, that's sentimentality. As soon as we start to think about that, you know, is, is playing this song actually going to change class relations or <laughs> overcome the political gridlock and terrible, you know, uh, problems of democracy that we have in this, this country here in the United States? Is it going to address the, you know, massive environmental problems that are just looming on, on the horizon, um, you know, where we could possibly destroy the, the, the you know, mm -hmm. environment for human beings altogether? Uh, no, it's not going to do that, right? And if you think, if you use reason, reason comes along, like Hegel says, and says, no, not everything is good in its, its own kind. As a matter of fact, uh, here he's like talking about one particular thing. Just because it is merely of a kind, reason finds things to be not good. It wants particularity. It wants to know why things are good. Mm -hmm. Third possible way out of this, the skepticism that we've seen come up before. Uh, in this case, it stresses this, uh, this idea of vanity. Mm -hmm. um, look, you can't rely on anything. Everything is, is, un, you know, is bad. Everything is nothingness. Um, he says here, Fear of the truth may lead consciousness to hide behind the pretension that it's burning zeal for truth. The skeptic is always saying, I'm, I'm seeking the truth. I'm the true inquirer. I'm not a dogmatist. It's burning zeal for truth makes it difficult or even impossible to find any other truth but the truth of vanity. Mm. That being, at any rate, cleverer than any thoughts that one gets by oneself or, or others. So you can say, well, none of it's any good. <laughs> um, that's another way to deal with the anxiety that human freedom brings about. So... He says, this conceit that understands how to belittle every truth in order to turn back into itself, notice what he says, it does turn back into itself. It is still reflexive, right? And it's still mm -hmm. a use of freedom. Um, and gloat over its own understanding, which knows how to dissolve every thought, and now we find the same barren ego, the same self, instead of any content. This is a satisfaction, Hegel says. People like that, leave them to themselves. You're not going to argue them out of it. You know, the, the good news is that uh, they don't really matter. <laughs> They're sort of just bumps on the road of the dialectic. Mm. And if they want to be stuck there or off in that cul-de-sac, you're not going to bring them out. You keep moving along, he mm. says. Um, this is a satisfaction we must leave to it. Not going to lie, that's hard for me because I'd be like, I'd be in the comments like, okay, think about this, blah, 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 blah. Because I feel like I was in that space at one point in time. But that's a good point. I, I don't think there was anybody that got me out of it, right? It was just at some point I was just like, you know what? I'm tired of this. Like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. It's not, it doesn't feel good to stay there, right? It's not, it doesn't bring me any further knowledge to, to think that, oh, there's no meaning and all this other stuff. Like, I come from a very religious background, and and I got out of that. I feel like, oh, there's no meaning, and what's the point of everything, and all this other stuff. But then I realized, you know, um, okay, like, And from there, I was able to, you know, get into other things. But that is that is a good advice right there. Is unfortunately, if you sit there and try to, you know, convince these people that, um, oh, there is meaning, and if you just do this and do that, blah blah blah, you're just wasting your time, right? Because they got they chose to put themselves in this position of this is what I believe, right? This is what they, you know, um, think everything amounts to, and until they choose to put themselves out of that to leave that cul-de-sac and go down the other road then there's not much you can do there it's not really anything you can do there and that's that's a hard but really good thing to remember especially nowadays and where you can just leave comments and spend all all day you know commenting <laughs> um about other things uh, whether it be on youtube or social or other social media platforms and things like that so very powerful itself it flees from the universal and seeks to be only with itself in each case in each one of these cases we have particularity and instead consciousness is supposed to be trying to attain this point which would be universality uh, now that, that's a, a long ways to go and we're nowhere 
near it yet. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of material to cover. But Hegel is at least telling us um, what's, what's supposed to be happening along the way. And this is really the central thing, that consciousness, by virtue of being consciousness, is always going to be posing limits and then crossing limits mm -hmm. and finding itself on the other side and having to deal with the fact that it, it's done that and that induces a kind of anxiety. Right. That was beautiful. Another another great section there. Um, learned a lot. Um, but as always, thanks for listening, watching. Let me know what you think. And um, we can we can go from here. A lot, a lot to learn. Um, a lot we learned there. So, uh, yeah. Let me end this dream. There we go. Uh.